Okay, um, welcome to the CMTC uh, seminar today. Um, it is my great pleasure to uh, introduce Ken Fai Mark from Cornell University as the seminar speaker. Um, Fai did his PhD at uh, Columbia University and then worked as a postdoc at Columbia and Cornell. Um, before joining the faculty at Cornell, he spent several years at Penn State, which is where I first met him. Um, Fai um, did many important works on 2D materials, especially TMD materials. Uh, today, um, uh, he will talk about the Kimberly Harbor physics in marine system. Fai, please. Okay. Yeah, thank you very much uh, for the introduction and for the invitation. It's my great pleasure to uh, give a talk in CMTC, uh, although remotely. And um, yeah, so today uh, I look forward to the discussion in the afternoon. And today I will actually uh, give you some update on uh, recent progress on a, a semiconductor materials in our lab. In particular, I will I, uh, try to uh, tell you that the rich phase diagram that one can realize in a particular compound, uh, which is molytellurite uh, stacked to tungsten selenide, uh, which we believe realized something very close to uh, the kamele Hubbard model. Okay, so uh, I don't know. So for the general audience, I uh, just give a very brief introduction. So the story begins uh, with the discovery of quantum Hall effect in 1980 by von Klinsick. So basically it's just that uh, for a two-dimensional electron fluid under a very high magnetic field, you see this precisely quantized a uh, Hall resistance rho xy uh, in units of h over e square. And it turns out that the quantization is so well these days that for the very clean sample, uh, the quantization is good for you know part per billion. So people actually even use it as a standard for the mass for defining the mass and uh, the, the mass unit for, for kilogram. And it turns out that uh, roughly two years later, very soon, uh, that people realized that, uh, in particular, TKNN in this paper realized that uh, this robust phenomenon is actually related to band topology. And in fact, it's related to something called the churn number for the amped Landau level, uh, which is an integral of the Berry uh, flux over the occupied state. And the Berry flux is defined in terms of the Berry curvature of the block band. And since it is really related to Berry curvature, then in 1988, uh, Duncan Haldane actually asked the question if it's possible to realize a churn insulator or the quantum Hall effect under zero magnetic field. And this is the model that he considered at the time. Uh, that this is a very simple Hamiltonian now uh, with a uh, H0, which is basically uh, the, the honeycomb Hamiltonian that includes only the nearest neighbor hopping, which is the same as graphene. And you will just give a, uh, it will just give you a uh, massless Dirac dispersion. And what he considered the additional term is actually this T2 term here, which is a purely imaginary hopping uh, connecting the nearest neighbor sites. And in this particular model, he's only considering either clockwise or counterclockwise, so that the Hamiltonian actually breaks a time reversal symmetry, although there's no zero magnetic flux going through the unit cell. And so the, this term actually would just live, produce an energy gap at the direct point, at the K and K prime point uh, of the Bridgewater zone. And we actually, we open a gap of opposite sign. This is plus sign gap and a negative sign gap at the K and the K prime values. And each of this value would contribute half a uh, churn number when you add up together, that will just give you the quantum anomalous Hall effect. So this, that's actually the first model uh, for quantum anomalous Hall effect uh, or churn insulator. Okay. Another important development is uh, basically it happened in 2005 uh, with the dis stimulated by the discovery of graphene in 2004, Kane and Malay uh, considered a model which actually in the absence of brush bus spin orbit interaction, uh, this is just two copies of the Haldane model that I uh, just introduced to you, two, ti two time reversal copies of the Haldane model. And now the T2 term, the next nearest neighbor hopping can now be considered as an icing spin orbit interaction uh, in this came Malay Hamiltonian. And as a result, because we have two copies, we have two spin copies, spin up and spin down copies of the band at both the K and the K prime values. So the band structure would look something like that. And the churn number will add up to zero because it preserves time reversal symmetry. So we actually get a zero quantized Hall, charge Hall effect. But if you actually define the spin Hall conductivity, you actually get a quantized spin Hall conductivity in the system because uh, the, the churn number around each of the value here is still carrying a 
uh, a very resolved churn number of one half. So um, this is the model for uh, first model for the quantum spin hall uh, effect in two dimension. Okay. So uh, although this model actually stimulated the discovery of later on the topological insulators, three dimensional topological insulator or the quantum spin hole insulator in two dimension, as well as actually the quantum spin, uh, sorry, the quantum anomalous hole insulator uh, in magnetic 3D TIs. Uh, the model is actually only like a toy model. It has little experimental relevance because the spin orbit interaction in graphene is just too weak, okay? And so uh, today I hope that, you know, I uh, tell you a material system that can realize something very close to a k Malay model. And uh, we also, I also mentioned a little bit about how we can actually realize how the physics in this system. All right, so that's a, uh, I'll give a brief, in, next I'll give a brief introduction on semiconductor marine materials. Most of you are extremely familiar with a, uh, my graphene marine materials, twisted by layer graphene especially because it's all over the news. But I will tell you a little bit about this type of material, uh, which is a little less known. Uh, the building block is actually uh, something called a monolayer transition metal dichocarginate semiconductor TMD. The structure looks something like this. Uh, it has three layers of atoms with the transition metal atoms sandwiched between two layers of calcogen. And if you look from top down, it has a honeycomb lattice structure, just like graphene, except now the A and the B sub lattice sites are occupied by different atoms so that the inversion symmetry is broken compared to the graphene. And the electronic states of interest are still located at the K and K prime values of the big Brillouin zone, which is illustrated here. So that because of the broken inversion symmetry or the broken sub lattice symmetry in the honeycomb, uh, energy gap is open at the K and K prime point. So on the right here is a schematic uh, band structure of the system that for the intrinsic material, the Fermi energy is located in the middle of the gap. And furthermore, because of the strong spin orbit interaction in the system and the broken immersion symmetry, uh, the spin state at each of the K and K prime value are actually split uh, by the spin orbit field. And uh, the K and the K prime are time reversal copies of each other. So you can actually see that from spin up go to spin down uh, for the same energies uh, at the, from K to K prime. So uh, the outer plane uh, spin is actually a good quantum number because uh, the spin orbit interaction is very much a icing, icing, spin, icing type of spin orbit interaction. And similar to graphene, you can actually form uh, moray materials using this, these systems. Uh, there are two ways to do it. You can actually put two of the same material forming a homobilayer. Uh, for instance, would be tungsten selenide. On tungsten selenide, that's the material of choice uh, for example, in the groups of Columbia. If you give it a twist uh, with a small angle of theta, you actually will produce a Moray period because of the interference at the, in the atomic structure. And the Moray period is roughly given by the lattice constant of the original material divided by the angle of theta. Or there's another way to do it is actually that you use two different materials and stack on top of each other. Uh, instead of giving it a twist angle, you can actually introduce a Moray pattern, even a zero twist angle. Uh, in this case, actually, that the Moray period is purely determined by delta here, which is the lattice mismatch between the two material. For instance, tungsten selenide on top of tungsten sulfide, the two material would have 4% lattice mismatch. So even you put the, the two together at zero degree twist, uh, you get actually a Moray period with a, we get a Moray super lattice with period about also 10 nanometer. Okay. All right, so the, the Moray period is actually real. You can see it under a, a scanning tunneling electron, a, sorry, scanning transmission electron mic microscope. So this is a STM, STEM image of another Moray system, which is molytelluride on top of tungsten selenide. This is a collaboration with Dave Muller's group at Cornell. And you can actually see that in addition to the very small atoms in uh, these original materials, you can now see the development of a Moray structure because of the interference in the atoms. And you can actually zoom out of the image, uh, even including 100 or 200 sites, uh, the Moray structure is very periodic. So the Moray structure is there. And on the right here, I'm showing that how the Moray period AM here, normalized by the lattice constant A, depends on the twist angle for both the homobilayer and the heterobilayer structure. Uh, for homobilayer, the Moray period is very sensitive to the twist angle, especially for small twist angle, you can see it's diverging uh, as one over the uh, twist angle. So in some sense, a, uh, in contrast for the heterobilayer, 
uh, for small twist angle limit is no longer dependent on the twist angle because everything is determined by the lattice mismatch. So in some sense, uh, there's an advantage of heterobilayer in the sense that you know that uh, it, the, the lack of sensitivity on the twist angle would mean that it's actually not so sensitive on uh, twist angle disorder compared to homobilayer. Tin yeah. five, may I ask a question? This is Shankar. Yes. Yeah, I didn't. I never saw this graph that you showed. I didn't realize that the homobilayer must be incredibly sensitive to disorder. The way it's diverging, particularly. Yeah, yeah, you can actually see angles. like. A, yeah. Yeah, like the two, uh, the magic angle graphene is around right. here. It's actually very sensitive. Yeah. So, so this... uh, in some sense, the homobilayer is not so good, right? In this sense, no. because of the angle disorder. No, I have and... to look into it. You know, in the work that I did on disorder, I did not take into account twist uh, twist bilayer at all. The work that we see on Jen, this may explain why the Columbia results. Some of it I do not understand at all. So. Oh my goodness, this is huge, it's vertical. So the, Col the Columbia result is a little better because they are around here. Oh, they're over there, I see. Okay. Yeah, so it's a, it's, a, it's a little better, yeah. But it's still more still sensitive. It's going up very to, fast. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And you yeah. are, where are you? Are you here, where your arrow is? Is that where you are? Uh, yeah, we are around here, basically. Around here. You can okay. see that it's right. almost uh, independent of the twist angle. So that's, a, a, in our opinion, is the yes. good thing about heterobilayer. Can you send me this figure? Because I've never seen this figure. Is it in oh. one of your papers? No, no, it's not in a, it's not in our paper. <laughs> this is something we I actually can... never plotted it. We just, yeah. I just show you in this talk. Yeah, I, I, uh, this is very important for theories. Could, could you please send it to me? I'll, yeah, yeah, know, yeah, just, yeah, just, yeah. Thank you, thank you. Yeah. Okay, I'm done. Okay, cool. Can I ask a follow-up uh, question? Yes. Yeah, this, this is Yang Zi. So um, my impression is that uh, at a smaller twist angle, at least for two C biograph in the relaxation effect is significant. And uh, I hope you, you can comment the relaxation for homo and the heto bilayer for the small angle regime. Yeah, yeah, uh, it's still important uh, for, especially as you mentioned for small test angle. And I think uh, in that sense, there may not be much a difference between a uh, twisted bilayer graphene and this material. Actually, it may be even worse in this material because the lattice the, the, the lattice is softer, right? The Young's modulus is smaller. So uh, in terms of lattice relaxation, it may be even more significant uh, in this material. It depend, really depends on how big the moray period is. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh, overall, all the structure tend to uh, expand the more stable uh, stacking structure, right? Compared to uh, the less stable stacking structure. So a rigid lattice, is, uh, it, it, it's really a quote approximation. And in all, in all moray materials, basically you have some deg certain degrees of lattice relaxation. Okay, uh, so with this note, uh, the, because of the emergence of the moray link scale, uh, there is a good approximation in separating the high energy physics and the low energy physics, which is purely determined by the moray period. And in some sense, you can forget about the original lattice structure and just treat the electrons with a certain band mass moving in a smooth periodic potential defined by the Moray lattice. And then uh, what this gives is actually some extra Bragg reflection uh, at the uh, mini Moray Brillouin zone, uh, you know, in the mini Brillouin zone, that you would just zone fold the big Brillouin zone to the small Brillouin zone. Mm -hmm. And then a, a series of a Moray flat bands would just emerge. Right. Okay. So, uh, it uh, actually was pointed out about four years ago uh, by Feng Cheng Wu, a former postdoc at actually CMTC and also Ella McDonald in a PRL paper that if you have a well enough, uh, isolated enough band uh, in, the, in this kind of materials, that actually the low energy, low energy physics can actually be mapped to a, a triangular Hubbard physics, a triangular lattice Hubbard model. Uh, in a sense, you would actually just think that, you know, the electrons are just trapped by the Moray potential of this artificial array of Moray atoms. And each of the atomic uh, trapping potential is about 100 to 200 milli electron volts. And the electron can actually tunnel between sides with an amplitude T. If you happen to put two electrons on the same side, they would just repel each other with an energy U on side repulsion. And they can also repel each other, you know, with nearest neighbor or next nearest neighbor repulsion, which is the extended range Coulomb repulsion B here. Okay, so uh, this, that, that would be the situation if you have a uh, isolated single band in the system. And to give you a sense of the energy scales, uh, typically the inter hopping is about one to 10 milli electron volts to the T here. 
The on-site U is big, uh, it's determined by the size of the one year orbital is about two nanometer. And you can actually plug in the number and calculate that the U is on the order of 100 million electron volt. And the next nearest uh, neighbor, Coulomb repulsion B is determined by the Moray period and is about 50 milli electron volt. And you can actually that, see that, you know, both the U and V can be big compared to the um, uh, kinetic energy of the electron or the tunneling rate between the nearest neighbor sites. So the system is really in a strong correlation limit. Okay, so in the past couple of years, uh, there are lots of uh, progress in terms of mapping uh, the phase diagram or the Fermi Hubble phase diagram in this limit of a well isolated band. And uh, the, these systems are highly tunable. You can actually tune the filling factor of the average filling factor of electrons per Moray site continuously using gay voltages. You can also tune the bandwidth of, a, of this flat band using a vertical electric field also continuously. And a lot have been found, and many of the contributions are also made in CMTC uh, Maryland. And so to summarize very briefly, uh, what people have found so far is that the mod insulating state at filling factor one, which corresponding to half band filling uh, of the more flat band. And also by tuning the bandwidth, one can actually introduce a continuous mod transition uh, 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 by just tuning the bandwidth. Okay. And in addition to filling factor one, uh, experimentalists have also observed a series of electron crystal states or so-called generalized Wigner crystal states have uh, commensurate fractional filling factors, which are illustrated by the blue areas here. And by tuning the bandwidth, you can also meld those uh, Wigner mod insulators to a Fermi liquid. And furthermore, one can also find a uh, stride phases and electronic liquid crystal states. And there are many more to be found, I think, uh, in the future. All right, but that's not the, the point of the talk uh, today. Uh, uh, the, the talk will be actually if focused I, on. If yeah, I yeah. may I ask you kind of a general question in the last yes. slide, yeah. uh, because we just had a, a rather, in, we have two talks on, on spin liquid at Maryland. No, we have 10 talks this, this week. So we have two talks on spin <laughs> liquid on this Roydberg atom spin liquid at Harvard, uh, uh, you know, just, just today and yesterday. So are there claims of observing spin liquid, not kind of indication and so on, you know, to write a paper, one may have to mention spin liquid, but has any experimentalist claimed that we are seeing a spin liquid in here? Because in principle, there could be, because the interaction is so long ranged, you know? Yeah, uh, I think uh, from a theoretical perspective, it's expected to be around somewhere, uh, yeah. but uh, I don't think any experiment has seen okay. it. No, I was asked uh, about experiment, yeah. Okay. Yeah, we have measured a little bit of magnetic susceptibility for the MOS states near yes. the uh, MOS transition, but you know, you cannot say that. You can't that, that, distinguish between the spin liquid and 120 degree antiferromagnet. Right? Yeah, the 120 yeah. degree is uh, subtle, yeah. right, uh, for the spin susceptibility. I but, think uh, one way to do it is really to measure the entropy of mm. the weak mod insulating state. And uh, if you really have something like a spin on Fermi surface, you will yes. get a linear in T dependent right. for the entropy right. right around here. Okay, yeah. thanks, bye. Yeah. Go on, go on. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, then a year later, uh, the same authors, Wu and McDonald, actually uh, figure out that if you now, let's not consider an isolated band, but if you can somehow intertwine the two bands, the two flat bands through some complex hopping, then you can actually introduce a very dependent churn band uh, in, in, in the system. And in fact, in this case, this, uh, the low energy physics can be mapped to a K-Malay model. That each, uh, uh, the orbitals of each this flat band actually forms a triangular lattice. When you combine the two together, it forms a honeycomb lattice. And the next nearest neighbor hopping, this T prime here would actually uh, would just produce a band dispersion for each of this flat band before band inversion. And this nearest neighbor hopping uh, T here is actually trying to uh, intertwine the two bands to introduce churn bands. Okay, so the, and also there is in general a, a sublattice potential difference between the A and the B sublattice sites, and that's tunable by the electric field uh, in this model. Okay, so let me just uh, give you a, a very concrete example of what we found last year, which realized something very close to the uh, prediction by Wu and McDonald that uh, this is a uh, AB stacked uh, moly telluride and on top of tungsten selenide moray. So how we make the sample is just that we start with these two pieces of material, we align them, we rotate one of this by 180 degree and just stack on top of each other to produce the moray pattern. Okay. And it turns out that uh, the, according to the DFT calculation, uh, the top uh, valence band is from the moly layer 
and they occupy the A site of a honeycomb. So they form a triangular lattice structure like this. And the next valence band is actually from the tungsten layer. It forms another triangular lattice site. The two together will form a honeycomb like this. So they occupy the B site for the tungsten. And the next nearest neighbor here actually corresponds to producing a band dispersion within each of this, each of this layer. And there's also this a uh, interlayer nearest neighbor hopping T term here, right? And if you just apply vertical electric field in the system, then you can actually uh, you can shift the bands around by the Stark effect, and you can cause a band inversion. And because of this T term here, the next uh, the nearest neighbor hopping, uh, a gap will be reopened, and then you get a churn band, a very resolved churn band in the system. And in this particular material set, actually the sublattice potential between the A and the B sites is equal to the interlayer potential because these two sublattices are belong to the different layers. So that uh, the application of an electric field can be used to conveniently tune the sublattice potential difference or the interlayer potential difference in this material system. And I'm going to show you that this works very well uh, in our experiment. Okay. So this a, a material system, as far as we understand it, it provides a physical realization of the uh, 2019 paper that I introduced here. And uh, let me just, uh, before I get into the results, let me just briefly tell you about the device structure that we look at. Uh, this is the Moray hetero-bilayer. It's sandwiched between the boron nitrides substrates, which are very good gate dielectric with the top and the bottom graphite gates. And because we have two gates, we have two degrees of freedoms right in our device. So we can actually independently tune the filling factor, the doping density in the moraine material, uh, as well as the electric field perpendicular to the material, which can actually cause band inversion in the system. Uh, the typical, a typical device is shown on the right that this area is the moraine area and is connected by multiple electrodes so that we can perform a uh, longitudinal and transverse resistance measurements under different temperatures and magnetic fields. Okay. So that's a, uh, the, basically the basic experimental setup. And all I'm going to tell you next is just all about resistivity measurements and um, oh, maybe a little bit about optics measurement as well, but uh, that's towards the end. Okay. Okay, this is the outline uh, of my uh, talk here. I just presented as a phase diagram. That what I'm going to tell you is actually about a rich phase diagram of this material system by tuning the electron filling factor in the Moray lattice and also the band inversion by the electric field, okay? And we actually find out lots of uh, interesting insulating states and I will just focus the talk at uh, filling factor one and filling factor two. And actually the filling factor two physics is uh, more related to single particle physics. So it's a uh, better understood. So I will just start uh, with this filling factor two and which means actually that we've just fixed the Fermi energy in between these two bands and we just use the electric field to cause a band inversion and see what happens. Okay, so this is the uh, work uh, led by our postdoc Wen Jing Zhao and a uh, graduate student Kai Fei Kang in the group. So first, uh, let's just measure the resistivity. So this is the, the resistivity as a function of the electric field, which is control, which is controlling band inversion, a fixed filling factor equal uh, nu equal to two. Okay, and uh, this is the measurement geometry is a standard four-point measurement that you pass a current along this direction, you measure the voltage drop a, uh, using these two voltage probes. And this critical electric field near 0.42 volt per nanometer is the band inversion point. You can actually see that before band inversion, the system is a band insulator. So as you decrease the temperature, the resistivity just diverge, uh, which is expected. But once you uh, go to higher electric field that cause a band immersion on the right here, you can actually see that a, the resistivity with decreasing temperature will saturate to a value very close to H over two E square. And then there's a plateau with the electric field that it becomes more or less independent of electric field uh, with increasing a, uh, uh, that, at, the, at the base temperature. And we can also compare this measurement which covers an edge to another measurement with a slightly different geometry that really measure the bulk transport of the system. And in this particular connection geometry is that we apply an AC excitation voltage at this electrode and ground these three electrodes all together and measure a current through only the opposite electrode here and the voltage drop across these two points because we are grounding these two electrodes here. This measurement is effectively a corbino this type of measurement which, which is only sensitive to the bulk transport of the system. 
So this is the result at the bottom. Again, the same resistivity, but just you know, uh, measuring now avoiding the edge, right? Resistivity versus electric field, that's the band immersion point. And now you can actually see that both before and after band immersion, the resistivity would just diverge uh, with decreasing temperature. Both sides would just displace an insulating behavior. So what it means is actually that uh, the result really shows that uh, after band immersion, the system is an insulator and it likely has a, 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 a helical edge state transport that pins the resistivity to about H over two E square when you measure, uh, perform a measurement that involves an edge. Hey, and this uh, is- Fai, can you go back to the last figure, which is an incredibly impressive figure. I mean, it's just absolutely incredibly impressive. So <clears throat> the, the quantization that you are seeing here it's better than a factor of two, it seems, right? I mean, it's it's like- Yeah, yeah, it's about- uh, I mean, it's it's a log scale, so I cannot quite tell, but it looks like it doesn't go to factor of two. It's not- uh, uh, it's, it's about 85%, 90% percent quantized, so yeah. Yeah, so, so that's a, better than better than any other quantum spin hole insular quantization I've seen. And the right part is just incredible that you can measure the bulk. So you are, I mean, this is the best- quantum spin hole experimental observation I have seen. And, you know, as my colleagues at CMTC know, I worry a lot about why it hasn't been seen. This is incredibly impressive. Uh, and, uh, okay, now I'm going to ask the crucial question. In how many samples have you seen this? Oh, actually you can see it uh, quite well. Uh, uh, in uh, it's As I said that uh, the hetero bilayer yeah. uh, is quite independent of the twist angle disorder. So, uh, <laughs> so it's, it's quite, quite generic. It's, it's quite, quite generic. generic. Yeah, yeah. You, wow. you, it's quite reproducible. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Are you yeah. going to post this paper? I'm going to tweet on this because this is a very. <laughs> no, no, I'm serious because, yeah. you know, uh, Feng Cheng and Jin Bao and, and they know my worry about it. Why hasn't this thing been seen? You know? So, so I, I can comment uh, uh, why this may be good in this particular system. Yes. And, uh, you know, the channel length here is actually about a micron to two micron. It's already mm -hmm. pretty long, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, it turns out that why we think that why this is good is that the channel is purely defined by the gate. So mm -hmm. uh, it's a very smooth edge. It doesn't oh. really have any like uh, atomic yes. size or anything around the edge. So I yes. think that's the main reason that uh, the quantization right. is pretty good. Yeah. Yeah, you should be very proud of this measurement. It's, it's incredible. Okay, continue, please. Very, very nice. Mm -hmm. I see a question also. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Uh, so this is Daniel Suarez from Hapetsu Group at JQI. Uh, I wonder uh, about the contacts because normally it is difficult to contact the TMD materials and normally people use graphite, right? But it seems challenging to, to use graphite for this kind of a structure. So I wonder what are those contacts made of? Or yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, we actually use a sort of a, a contact gates to make the contacts better. Uh, in our device. So the contacts are made of a very thin films of a, uh, this is like five nanometer thick uh, platinum electrodes. And uh, so we use platinum because it has very large work function, which just match well uh, to this uh, Moray system. And there's also a particular reason why we actually choose this particular combination for the material is that first, the Moray telluride has a smaller band gap. Actually it has the smallest gap among all the TMD semiconductors. So that actually makes making contacts easier. And I, uh, the second reason is actually that this material has large lattice mismatch. It's about 7%. And the Moray period is about five nanometers. So it's actually on the small side of many of these Moray materials. And what that means is actually that the Moray density is high. It's like five times 10 to the 12. And because we are dealing with such high Moray density, it also makes our contact a lot easier. You know, we are not fighting to measure a very low density, we are measuring a fairly high density uh, compared to the, uh, you know, compared to the absolute density, this more density is high. So uh, all these factors would just make uh, the formation of contact uh, good. And finally, I would just mention that we are putting a top gate then apply a huge electric field to the vertical heterostructure. Uh, what that means is actually that we dope the materials heavily around these electro regions. And so all this sort of by design that it actually makes very good uh, uh, contact in the system uh, when you apply large electric field. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. And actually the, the contact can be so good around the two that, uh, I mean, this actually can, uh, even the two point measurement, uh, uh, you can actually see very good quantization.
the Thank contact you. resistance is only a few hundred ohms around a uh, this uh, this new good to two yeah because we are dealing with a density of 10 to the 13 already at new good to two yeah i hope this answers your question yeah yeah, yeah. thank you very much okay uh, can I ask a question regarding the contact, the, the quantum spin hole edge state? Yeah. Uh, so my understanding is that uh, uh, although there are many theory on the edge transport, like a PV co-locking liquid, but uh, my understanding is that uh, they, I mean, the experimental result, meaning the temperature dependence uh, cannot be fully understood from any theory based on helical lactinger liquid. So I'm curious, can you tell, I, I know you are showing the temperature dependence, but uh, like, uh, can you comment on the temperature dependence? Like uh, if uh, you get some power law or it's logarithmic or is something else? I see. Uh, yeah, a very good question. We actually did not try to look at the uh, interaction physics for this 1D edge channels. Uh, yeah, so I cannot answer your question at this point, whether it follows certain specific power law that agrees with the helical Luttinger liquid. We have to actually analyze that a, a bit more carefully. Yeah, but th thank you for the question. But yeah, we, we actually have not looked at it. And uh, maybe another uh, quick question is that, uh, um, what is the regime, uh, energy regime you, you see this uh, quantization? I, I think it's probably related to the the this the electric field you tune, uh, but the, I I'm curious. Uh, can you do? You, can you give us some number like uh, what's the maybe like uh, it's basically probably asking the probably the bulk gap. Yeah, Pretty the, the like, bulk gap actually can be fitted around here. Okay. Uh, it's about ten kelvin if I remember the number correctly. Oh. Yeah, and so I think a, a rule of thumb is roughly that you cool down to about 10% of the gap size. Uh, the quantization uh, roughly starts, you know, to get there. So, uh, so basically around one Kelvin uh, temperature scale that, that uh, let's see. Yeah, this is, uh, this is two Kelvin. Yes, right. Mm -hmm. Yes, so around a, uh, yeah, one Kelvin, to Kelvin energy scale, we start to see a pretty nice quantization. Yeah. I see, thank yeah. you. Yeah, and this is contrast to the bulk, right? As you can see that the bulk is about an order of magnitude higher uh, uh, resistance. Yeah, okay. And we, yeah, just a last comment is that we also have performed a little bit more uh, on local transport and angle dependent magnetic resistance. And all seem to agree very well that, you know, this is a quantum spin hole insulator after band immersion. Okay. Yeah, uh, so that's, uh, that's it. And uh, actually given the time interest, maybe I should just move on. Uh, I'll skip the rest on new good two. Uh, what I'm trying, to tell you uh, about new good two, uh, but because of time limit, I will just skip. Uh, what I was intending to telling you that you can actually try to apply a magnetic field to uh, reduce two copies of the K Molay to one copy, which is the Haldane model, and you can see the emergence of a uh, churn insulator coming out. Uh, so that actually is further confirms that this is a quantum spin hole insulator because once you apply a magnetic field, you can just reduce the two copy to one copy, and you get a churn insulator. Uh, out from the system, but yeah. So that's a, uh, about new equal to two. Uh, that uh, I hope I convinced you that we actually, by tuning electric field, we can make the system going from a band insulator to a quantum spin hole insulator. And I have not got the time to tell you that how we actually split the K-Malay to a Haldane model, but I think that's actually an interesting platform to use magnetic proximity effect to, uh, to make a quantum anomalous hall insulators in the future. Okay, so uh, I would like to tell you a little bit more about the complicated phase diagram of filling factor equal to one, which is actually a half band filling. So what I'm going to tell you next is that we just keep the Fermi energy fixed at half band filling of the Molly band and use the electric field to introduce band inversion. And as you expect, uh, this is probably a metal without any correlation, but in most of the phase region that we see, uh, it is actually an insulator. So it really highlights the importance of uh, topology and band uh, electronic correlation uh, at filling factor equal to one. So this, uh, the work that I'm going to show uh, are the works from Ting Xinli and Sheng Wei Jiang, uh, two of former postdocs in our group. 
and Zui Tao and Bo Wenshen, uh, two graduate students in our group. Okay, so uh, here, let me just summarize what I'm going to tell you at filling factor equal to one. Again, this is resistivity uh, as a function of the electric field, the electric field to band inversion. So at high electric field, uh, you have band immersion. The band immersion actually happens at the first dash line, which is shown here uh, around 0.69 volt per nanometer. Uh, before band immersion, the system is actually a triangular lattice mod insulator. So you can actually see that the resistivity will diverge uh, with decreasing temperature. And after band immersion, some of the holes are actually transferred from the Molly layer to the tungsten layer. That we get actually a spin polarized churn insulator that I'm going to tell you a bit more later on. And over this range between the two dash line, it's a spin polarized churn insulator uh, with small resistivity uh, at low temperature. And then if you go beyond another second critical point here, that you can actually see that a, there's another insulating state developed with resistivity going up uh, with decreasing temperature. And uh, I hope to convince you that we have observed an intervalley coherent antiferromagnetic state uh, at the highest electric field after this a, a quantum critical point. Okay, so I will try to argue, you know, I will try to present uh, our argument why we think these are the states to you uh, in the next few slides. Okay, so let me just begin with a, uh, the churn insulator uh, between these two dash lines. And it's in contrast to the quantum spin hole insulator, it's fairly easy to show that if you have a quantum anomalous hole insulator because it produces robust a charge, uh, hall, uh, ch sorry, a, ch a charge hall effect. So uh, what I'm showing here is basically that once you cool the sample below two Kelvin, you get robust hall quantization to H over E square. And you also see a clear magnetic hysteresis loop really, really shows that the system is ferromagnetic. And at the same time, the longitudinal resistivity would just go to very small value compared to the uh, RXY. So all these are typical signatures of a quantum anomalous hall insulator. And uh, zero magnetic field quantization persists about two Kelvin, uh, which is quite comparable to twisted bilayer graphene as reported by Andrea Young's group. Okay. So uh, the next natural question is to ask, what is the nature of this uh, churn insulator that we observed? And it turns out that there are actually two possibilities for AB stacked uh, TMD heterostructures. And one possibility is shown on the left here is that the electrons in both layer or the holes actually in both layers would have a uh, spin up. That meaning that the spin are actually co-polarized in the two layers. And this is the schematic band diagram for this configuration. What it means is actually that because of the interaction, the Fermi energy now is cutting both the Molly and the tungsten band and in both cases, spin up, spin up bands. But because of the AB stacking, what that means is actually that it's a very coherent state because the Fermi energy is now cutting through bands from both of the valleys. And because it's a churn insulator, an energy gap has to be opened at the Fermi energy. So it's a very coherent state. It's a spin polarized, very coherent state. Okay, another possibility is that actually that the holes in the two layers have spin opposite aligned to each other. They are like, you know, basically like in this figure here. And the bottom shows the schematic uh, energy diagram. Because of the interaction, uh, the, uh, the holes are very polarized so that the Fermi energy is cutting bands only from one valley. And because of AB stacking, what that means is actually that electrons from the same valley from both layers will have opposite spins. So in this case, will be spin anti-parallel to each other. And in fact, uh, including the study in CMTC uh, from Shankar's group, and as well as a few other studies, all these uh, theory, theory predictions would just predict that from infield calculation that it has to be the very polarized case. So uh, I'm going to show you an experiment that show uh, to tell you that whether it is spin polarized or very polarized. Okay, then the experiment. Uh, let me uh, introduce this slide a little bit more carefully. The experiment is the following. Here I'm showing the band diagram for the entire heterostructure which includes both the conduction band here and the valence band. So this is the, you know, the conduction Moray band, which is like one EV above the uh, valence Moray band, right? So this is a, a large energy gap, it's about one EV. And uh, different bands from the different layers are shown by different colors and the spins are also shown by, you know, the dashed line on the solid line. And one important thing about the optical selection rule in the TMD material is actually that the handedness of the photon is locked to the spin of the bands. 
So what I mean here is actually that if you look at the Molly transition, the sigma plus light, the left-handed light will just connect states of spin up. And the sigma minus light will just connect states with spin down, okay? The same for the tungsten layer, sigma plus connects spin up, sigma minus connects to spin down. And now we can, if we perform this measurement for each of this layer and do a calculation that just subtracts the left-handed absorption by the right-handed absorption, we produce a signal called the magnetic circular dichroism, MCD. And this signal is directly proportional to the spin polarization in each layer. Because the photon energy that connects the transition for each of the layer can be very different. So we have no trouble to resolve the layer independently in our measurement. So let's uh, talk about what do we expect in each of this scenario. If it's a spin polarized case, what it means is actually that the spins in each layer are co-aligned. And as a result, the MCD signal, which is proportional to the spin polarization in each layer, will have the same sign, right? And will have the same magnetic field dependence. And this is what we expect. We will have a same spontaneous magnetization in each of the layer, and they just depend on the magnetic field in the same way. On the other hand, if it's actually a very polarized state, the spin in the two layers are anti-aligned. And as a result, at zero magnetic field, the sign of the MCD at the tungsten layer and the Molly layer are opposite to each other. Okay. And because Molly has a smaller spin orbit interaction, we would expect that under large enough magnetic field, the spin of the Molly will be aligned to be co-parallel uh, with the tungsten layer. So the MCD dependence on the magnetic field would just have this kind of dependence that is totally different from the spin polarized case. Because you know, they start will be anti-aligned and then finally the Molly layer will be flipped over to the same as the tungsten with a large enough magnetic field. So uh, this is our experiment. And what I'm showing here is just very uh, simple experiment that we just measure the MCD for the Molly layer and the tungsten layer as a function of the magnetic field. At the same time, I show the RXY measurement, which is quantized to H over E square. Okay. And you can actually see that in both layers, now the MCD will just co-evolve in the same way with magnetic field that is expected for the spin polarized case. And if you zoom in in the small magnetic field region, you actually can also see a clear magnetic hysteresis in the MCD signal. So all this results will actually really show that this simple measurement will just show that it's the spin polarized case rather than the very polarized case for the trend insulator uh, uh, that we have. Okay. So a uh, last word about this uh, trend insulator is that as I mentioned, if it's spin polarized, then the Fermi energy is actually cutting bands from the two different valleys. And because the churn gap still has to be opened, it's likely a very coherent state then we just think that, is it possible that it's actually the churn gap is opened by some kind of exotonic condensation mechanism? And it turns out that there is a recent theory archive paper uh, that shows that this is probably the reason that when we go from a MOS state, when all the electrons in the Molly layer, with increasing electric field that transfer some of the electrons to the tungsten layer, there are some exotonic interaction between the electrons and holes in the system. And that may be the origin for the exotonic churn insulator, uh, for the churn insulator that we observed. Uh, however, I would just point out that this theory still predict a very polarized state, not a spin polarized state. So I think this is still something that had to be worked out by the theorists to you know, explain to us why we actually get a spin polarized state rather than a very polarized state. Okay, so uh, that's about the churn insulator and uh, let me know if you have questions and uh, I will just, you know, use the last few minutes to talk about this final state here, uh, which is the, uh, we, we believe it's an intervalley coherent antiferromagnetic state after uh, this dash line here. Okay, so uh, let me just compare it. Uh, I want to show you that this is actually an antiferromagnetic state. First, let me just compare the spin susceptibility measurement for both the uh, churn insulator and this uh, antiferromagnetic insulator. First, let me just go to the churn insulator. And this is a measurement of the magnetic susceptibility chi. And you can actually see that the magnetic susceptibility will just diverge at the uh, Curie temperature. And you can also see at the bottom, we plot it as one over the, the inverse susceptibility as a function of temperature. In the high temperature limit, it follows a, it follows a Curie-Weiss law with a positive Curie-Weiss temperature of five Kelvin and below that temperature, the spontaneous order parameter will just come in. Okay, so that's a typical uh, ferromagnetic uh, behavior, uh, which is actually you would expect for a churn insulator. And this is the behavior for the, uh, for the antiferromagnetic insulator. 
again, the magnetic susceptibility, the inverse magnetic susceptibility, you can actually see that now we don't actually have a um, divergence of the susceptibility. And instead, there is a broad susceptibility peak at around uh, six Kelvin in this uh, particular electric field. And once we go the temperature below that uh, susceptibility peak, the resistivity of the sample will just shoot up by orders of magnitude. And we can also perform a Curie-wise fitting in the high temperature data, and we get a negative five Kelvin uh, Curie-wise temperature. The negative sign means that we have antiferromagnetic interaction, uh, which is totally in contrast with the, a, uh, the ferromagnetic churn insulator. Okay. So this measurement showed that the uh, interaction between the local moments for this state is antiferromagnetic. And then next is that I hope to show you that it is actually indeed antiferromagnetic ordered at low temperature. So this is a plot uh, of the MCD, basically is the spin polarization in one of the layers as a function of the magnetic field as we cool the samples uh, from six Kelvin, which is the Curie-wise temperature below, the, uh, below that. And, and you can actually see that at the higher temperature, you see a paramagnetic type of behavior for the magnetization. But once you go to low temperature, that the temperature is small compared to the Curie-wise temperature, you see uh, signatures of metamagnetic transitions at the characteristic magnetic field about three Tesla, that you have a faster growth of the magnetization with magnetic field. Okay. And to convince you further, I'm actually showing here the MCD spectrum. So this is the extracted MCD signal, but this is the MCD spectrum as we cool the sample from six Kelvin to 1.6 Kelvin. You can really see like there's a sudden peak shift around this characteristic magnetic field of two to three Tesla. That really shows that there is a uh, sudden magnetic transition that is induced by the magnetic field. It's consistent with the magnetic, metamagnetic phase transition in the system. So this uh, result really actually showed that there is indeed long range antiferromagnetism in the system. And if you're still not convinced, let me just show you the transport data. This is the RXY and the RXX, the top and the bottom panel as a function of the magnetic field at different temperatures. You can actually see that there is a sudden increase of the RXY once you go beyond three Tesla. And then the RXY was just saturated to the quantized value of H over E square. So the result here actually show you that we start with an antiferromagnetic state of this kind of spin orientation, uh, but we can actually tilt the spins by the external magnetic field to the outer plane direction and produce a spin polarized churn insulator. And in the RXX channel, you can actually see that in this magnetic field induced topological phase transition, there's a quantum critical point that around 10 kilo ohm that in this characteristic magnetic field, the resistivity is almost independent of temperature and it's locked to about 10 kilo ohm. Okay, I see a question. Uh, yes, I have a question about the metamagnetic meta transition. So uh, do you see hysteresis around the jump uh, at finite magnetic field? Yeah, we don't. We do not seem to see a uh, hysteresis. Yeah, although like there is indeed a jump in the spectrum, right? And also, like a fairly fast slope. Like you start with a small okay. slope and then it goes up, but we don't seem to see clear hysteresis around here. Okay, but we we expect if it's a metamagnetic metamagnetic transition, it should have some uh, hysteresis, right? Uh, but maybe if it's a like a. I don't know if it's like a slow counting of the of this uh, uh, antiferromagnetic state. Then maybe you don't need to go through a, a hysteresis, right? Oh, another thing to mention about uh, maybe it's actually not a first order transition uh, okay. is that the RXX has looks like it shows a quantum critical point that uh, the RXX is locked at about ten kilo ohm, independent of temperature. Okay. Okay. I see. Yeah. Okay. Got it. Thank you. It's probably a continuous transition. Yeah. Right. Right. Okay. Okay. Uh, so finally, let me just summarize uh, all these results about the phase diagram at nuclear one, and there are three different states: the triangular mod insulating state region one, the spin polarized trans state region two, and then the antiferromagnetic state, which is intervalley coherent at region three, and there are three panels here. Let me just walk through one by one. That the first panel is the Curie-wise temperature. And uh, only at region two, uh, the Curie-wise temperature is positive. So it's a ferromagnetic interaction. At both region one and region three, the uh, 
the Curie-wise temperature is negative, so that it shows that local moments interact with antiferromagnetic interaction, as you would expect for the mild insulator, and also for antiferromagnetic insulator. In the middle panel, I'm showing the charge gap as measured from thermal activation and from a uh, capacitance measurement. And you can actually see that the gap size will just decrease uh, continuously to zero uh, at the boundary between two and three. And so this suggests that it's a continuous quantum phase transition uh, from the trans state to the antiferromagnetic state. But we do not seem to see a charge gap closure at the boundary between one and two between the insulator and the trans insulator. And finally, at the panel three here is showing the spontaneous spin polarization in the system. And you can actually see that the spontaneous spin polarization is only present in region two, which is what you expect for a trend insulator. And with increasing temperature, the spontaneous polarization would just go away. Okay. So uh, there's a charge gap closure of a topological phase transition from two to three, but there's no charge gap closure from one to two. And finally, this is the final slide. And I just want to briefly contrast the behavior of a triangular lattice and a honeycomb lattice. So for small electric field, we actually have a triangular mod insulator. And when we measure the spin polarization versus magnetic field, even at a temperature that is small compared to the Curie-wise temperature, we still see uh, paramagnetic behavior. We do not seem to see uh, metamagnetic transitions in the system. But once we actually put the charge in both layers that they form a honeycomb lattice, you can immediately see actually a metamagnetic transition in the spin polarization versus magnetic field plot. These two states have pretty similar Curie-wise temperature and very similar, basically the same measurement temperature. The only difference is actually a triangular lattice in a, in, in, a, in a honeycomb lattice. And I thought this actually shows nicely the effect of geometric frustration in the system by just tuning the electric field. So uh, yeah, to summarize, uh, I just summarized with a partial k uh Hubble phase diagram here for your reference. And I hope to convince you that we have realized a, uh, basically the k malay Hubble physics uh, in this AB stacked multi-terroid tungsten cellular heterostructure. And I believe that many phases still remain to be mapped out. And I only focus on filling one and filling two. And actually I think all of these uh, Fermi liquid states at incommensurate fillings are also interesting. And there are many questions to be asked, can we, somehow engineer this system to produce high temperature quantum anomalous Hall effect. I think we have some ideas on how to do it. Can we observe superconductivity somewhere? For instance, around this a Fermi liquid region, can we, can we observe that? And will we see difference? If we see superconductivity, if the band is topological or not, can that make a difference? Can we see topological density wave somewhere? It's been predicted uh, by the recent theory paper from CMTC, but uh, you know, it's not been seen so far. Can we see fractional trend insulators? And also there is interesting theory from uh, University of Maryland talking about light control trend insulator. And because of, uh, because of the big semiconducting gap in this system, I think this is a very interesting avenue to explore the control of trend insulator by ultrafast lasers. And with this, I thank the people again involved in the work uh, we share lab with Professor Ji Shan at Cornell, and I already acknowledge some of the people involved in this work. And from the theory side, we acknowledge uh, you know, theory discussions with Liang Fu's group and also from Alan McDonald's group. And the optics experiment, we collaborate with Tony Hines group in Stanford, and also the HBN crystals are from the famous Japanese group. And uh, this is the funding source. And just I thank you for your attention. All right, uh, thank I for the wonderful talk. Uh, any questions? Yeah, uh, Yangzi, let me ask a question because I have to run off to a meeting. So, uh, uh, so uh, uh, Kim Fai, very, very nice talk and of course, very, very nice work. And I'm, I'm gonna talk to you a little bit. Uh, two quick questions. One is that, you know, the, these systems as you and I have discussed before uh, have some disorder, right? Because this is, yeah. Regular TMD, the mobility is not very high and so on. Uh, are they doing anything to the phases you are talking about to the extent you can see experimentally? Forget all theory, just experimental. Yeah. Uh, so basically it would just, uh, for, for, first of all, it would just broaden uh, this okay. uh, range, right? Uh, you need yeah. to fill up the in-gap states. Yeah. And that's about 5% mm -hmm. uh, of the lattice. 
So uh, what the, what would be the energy scale then? So that that that's the basic thing that happens. Yeah, yeah. So uh, yeah, the the broadening of the energy level uh, mm -hmm. is about 0.1 to 0.2 milli electron volt. Uh, so that's kind of consistent with yeah. the disorder, right? It, it's fairly similar to what you have calculated. No, no, right, no. That's why I asked the question, right? So then, then I'm happy. And my second quick question, it's a bit self-serving. This gap not closing, I, I lost the track a little bit. You know, we have an explanation for that. Uh, do you buy that at all? Do you, do you reject that at all? Or you haven't thought about it? Yeah, I, I think it's very reasonable that it's a first order transition without okay. a gap closure. Okay. But uh, just a little bit puzzle is that we do not seem to see like a jump or something. Yeah, no, I know. I, I don't, know. maybe it's a it's disorder. That's why I was asking uh, about disorder, right? And, yeah, and, and, uh, we yeah. sort of know that the disorder uh, uh, electric field is about probably plus minus two millivolt per nanometer, which is around this range, right? It's the distance yeah. between the two points. So yeah. that could smear things out, especially if the jump yeah. in gap size is small, right? right? And we can do an you know, order of magnitude estimate. That's precisely why I asked you about the dessert. Thank you very much. Uh, in fact, I have to run, but I'm going to talk to you at two o'clock, okay? Okay. I signed All up. Right. I signed up. Okay. Thank you very much, okay? Okay. Other, others should continue. Thank you. Yeah. I'm happy to take uh, additional questions. Yeah. Yandri, please. Uh, yeah, I, I just uh, muted myself. I don't know what, how you how you figure out I want to ask a question. So anyway, so uh, I have two questions. Maybe first on this slide, uh, I think you mentioned, but I miss. How should I understand the evolution of uh, the lattice from triangular lattice to honeycomb lattice? That's the maybe the first question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah uh, mm -hmm. it's it's a. Uh, so it seems that uh, the picture. Let me just go back to uh, here. That uh, as far as we understand the picture this picture works pretty well for this system. So that uh, you have the Molly band and the tungsten band. When you increase the electric field, you cause a band immersion. And at that point, some of the holes will be transferred to the tungsten layer, right? At the beginning, all the holes will be in the Molly layer. But with an electric field, some of the holes will be transferred to the tungsten layer. And we actually have experiment to show that that's precisely the case because uh, this, the excitons in the tungsten layer is very sensitive to doping, okay? And if there is no doping in the tungsten, you will actually have a very strong neutral excitons in the system, which is in this case. And this, with increasing electric field, and this, the dashed line here is exactly the point that the system will enter into a churn insulator. And once the system does that, then the excitons will become, suddenly become very weak. And, you know, you probably are not very familiar with this, but for, to us, is we are very familiar with this. That would just mean that the tungsten layer is actually hold doped immediately after this point. So we know that uh, basically the system, before getting into the churn insulator, all the holes are in the Molly layer, so that you will expect it's a triangular lattice. But once it enters into the churn insulator beyond that point, the tungsten is also doped. And we cannot say for sure it is a honeycomb lattice. But since uh, we also, there are many of these observations that this antiferromagnetic state seem to be consistent with a, a honeycomb lattice once the holes are transferred to the, to the tungsten layer. Yeah, thank you. I think this answer my first question. And yeah. my second question on this part is that uh, you show this uh, fitting from, from paramagnetic state. And it, it seems to be quite interesting that uh, the Spin polarized side, you got Q wise temperature, Q temperature around 5k, and yeah. also that seems to be the same magnitude for the anti ferro insulator side. So I'm curious, do you know why those? Uh, yeah. Oh, you, uh, no, this, sorry, this is sort of by accident. Uh, we okay. just picked the electric field. You can actually see that it's evolving, right? Oh, right, right. Yeah. Okay, yeah. okay. We just happened to pick this point and that point. <laughs> Okay, so so that's highly tunable. That's tunable. Yeah, 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 yeah. And uh, maybe very, a very quick uh, uh, question or uh, on the first part. I mean the quantum spin hole part, and and because I'm I to be honest, I'm very interested in that. Uh, so I'm curious, can you tune interaction effect uh, in the system? Since you mentioned you can realize the Kam Kamali Haber model. Yeah. Uh... Uh, 
we can turn the bulk gap size a little bit. As you can see, right, over this electric field, the bulk gap size keeps increasing with the electric field. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's sort of indirect in terms of tuning the interaction. Are you thinking of tuning the interaction in this 1D channel? Yeah, yeah, ultimately, but I imagine usually we can only tune interaction from the bulk and and maybe maybe yeah. somehow you I do not have a very good way to tune just the interaction in the edge, but we can certainly naturally here that tune the bulk gap size, and that I believe is translated somewhat to the <laughs> to the to the physics of the one D channel, but uh, indirectly, right? Uh, yeah, I don't yeah. have a very good way. I, I cannot think of a very good way at this point how to tune the interaction on the one D channel. Okay. Yeah. So, so I will probably discuss the uh some some follow up with yeah. you in yeah. a later discussion. I will. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. But by the way, Yang Yang Yangzhi, I I know you wanted to ask questions because you raised the hand uh, right after the talk. Yeah. Um. Uh, yeah. Daniel, please. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to understand a little better the antiferromagnetic state. Uh, can we understand that as a gas of electrons in one layer, a ferromagnetic gas of electrons in one layer, and a ferromagnetic gas of holes in the other layer? That point. Yeah, that's what we guess, basically. Yeah, uh, sorry, it's probably running a little fast. The <laughs> red balls here are really the in the in the Molly layer, and the blue balls here are actually in the tungsten layer, right? The holes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we believe this is sort of the configuration for the state. Uh, okay, so it's two ferromagnetic states on each layer, and they yeah, we, we know that they that cannot phase. be they cannot be up down up down without the plane spin, because if that's the case, we will actually get a spontaneous uh, MCD in each of the layer, which we do not see. So uh, it has to be in plane, the spin. Ah, uh, oh, okay then. So it's not yeah, upside yeah. down, but in plane in plane of the ferromagnetic. Yeah. Oh, okay, and it's and, and it's a very. It seems like there is a very delicate uh, tuning on the parameters because you have to change the density of charge. The electric field also plays a role. It seems the temperature. Yeah, uh, we have a to very small region field. in which you can distinguish such kind of a state, there, right? Yeah, we, the electric field has to be large, right beyond this point that you kill the charge insulator, and uh, filling. We just always keep at the filling factor equal to one, right? Half time mm -hmm. filling. But what is the exact role of the electric field? How does it help to the, to, to the formation of such states? We don't know. We just know that, you know, based on uh, feeling factor equal to two, we just know that the electric field, what the electric field does is to tune the band immersion. So that's sort of, you know, uh, uh, this tuning parameter in this phase diagram. We can, because of the stark effect, we can actually make the Molly and the tungsten band to just invert. That's the only thing we know. And why that was stabilized this state uh, beyond this electric field, I don't know. <laughs> okay. Yeah, we, we are just telling you what we observed. Yeah, we just don't know. You know, we don't have an explanation for why this is stabilized. Yeah. Well, that makes it more interesting. <laughs> yeah, we, we, we just tried to tell you, yeah, we sort of do this experiment and tell you what we think these states are. But yeah, we have no explanation of why they occur at this specific electric field and filling. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah. yeah um, any other questions? Uh, yeah, I actually have a, a really a clear question. Um, do you have any uh, measurement on the bandwidth of the chain bands in the in the in the quantum anomalous phase? Uh, and no. <laughs> no. Okay. Yeah. That. It's supposedly, that, you need to do something like RPES, but unfortunately, or, or RPES STM, these days, maybe, yeah. Oh yeah, STM. Uh, yeah. STM would not work very, may not work oh, because here is uh, the, the the electron gas is sort of embedded right between the. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah that's true. RPES of them would also mean RPES. Uh, okay, uh, at least uh, you you're right that we can probably do an experiment, fully expose the surface doing RPES or STM. At least we even we don't know the uh, bandwidth of the trend band, we will actually at least know the bandwidth of the Moray band, right? Of the single particle Moray band. Yeah. And that give you a, give us a sense of <laughs> what things might be. Yeah. It's hard to measure that, yeah. Okay. Um, if there are no more questions, let us thank Bye for the wonderful talk again.
Okay, um, thank you. Okay. And I look forward so to discuss with you guys later.